Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church. Healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Ashley, and I am so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, pen, and paper, your phone, however you want to take notes, and get ready for today's message. We're in a series called The Armor of God. The Armor of God. Has anybody ever heard of The Armor of God? Read it in the Bible before? few of you, three of you, five of you, six of you, okay, some of you have heard it, the armor of God. And, and we know that it's the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit. And I, I still have a hesitation to get to talking about the armor yet. And I'll tell you why. We're a spirit-filled church. We're a faith-based based church. My dad would have come out of something called the Word of Faith movement. A very, very faith-filled, name it and claim it, uh, that kind of thing, like very hyper-faith. And... I come to this question, when I'm thinking about the armor of God, when I'm thinking about who we are in Christ, our identity as Christians, and here's the question, why do we need weapons and armor if the devil's defeated? If Satan's defeated, then why do we need armor and weapons? Right? Does this make sense? Is this a logical question? All right, so the Bible says that Jesus, when he died on the cross, he went down into hell. He whooped up Satan. He made a display of him openly, the Bible says. He took the power. See, and that's, that's like the worst kind of beat down, isn't it? It's one thing to get beat up in the streets, but it's another thing to get beat up in your own house. Come on, somebody. To get beat up in your own bedroom, right? And, and Jesus went down into hell. He made a display of Satan openly, it says. He took the keys of the kingdom. He took the power of death, hell, and the grave. He rises up victorious. He gives that authority and that power to every believer. So the question is, if we live and operate in that power and in that liberty and in that freedom, then why do we need weapons and armor if the devil's defeated? Why does it seem as if the battle is still raging. If we are translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, the Bible says, then why does it still feel like Satan's kingdom is influencing our lives? If Jesus destroyed principalities and powers and rulers of the dark, then why does it seem as if there are still strongholds in my mind? Have you ever read your Bible and questioned it like this before? If the devil's defeated, then why is all this bad stuff still happening? I want to paint a picture today by telling you a story. There was a farmer. He's called in the middle of the night by the police. The police say, one of your animals has escaped, and it's been hit by a car. It's laying dead on the side of the road. It happens to be one of your prized goats. So the farmer gets his coat on. He gets dressed. He drives to the location to where... This animal is supposedly dead, and he rolls up, and he sees his goat lying there. But the goat is not dead. It didn't escape. Somebody had stolen this goat, had wrapped up its feet, bound it up, and dumped it on the side of the road for it to simply die. So the farmer goes up to the goat, and he sees that it's alive. He sees it's just been simply abandoned on the side of the road. He unties its feet. Slaps it on the butt, says, get out! What does the goat do? Nope, lays there. Lays there, just lays there, looking, back, looking up at, at its owner, the farmer. Slaps on the butt again. I said, get up! What does the goat do? Lays there, staring at the farmer. So the farmer's like, what, what is going on? Did I miss a rope? Did I miss something that's happening here? And he's examining the goat for blood and injury, and maybe somebody did run over its legs. Maybe its legs are broken, and he checks the goat out, and everything seems to be fine, but he notices that the goat's legs are still kind of in contact with one another as if it's still bound, as if the ropes are still there. The goat has been freed, but it doesn't know that it's been freed. The farmer grabs the goat by the wool, sets it up on its feet, smacks it in the butt, and says, now get up! What does the goat do? It goes jumping off all goaty and happy and, and, and peaceful, and it's free. 
You say, what's the point of the story? We're a lot like that goat. Most of us are just like it, and by goat, I don't mean greatest of all time. (laughs) We were previously bound by Satan's destructive power. He tied us up in total slavery to sin, in total slavery, like there was no way we could help ourselves, and then he dumped us on the side of the road until we were completely ruined in life. But then, hopefully, we've come to hear the gospel message. We've come to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, and we've been saved by the finished work. And at that point, at that moment, when we received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he reached down, he untied our legs. He untied us, he set us free through the work at the cross. He's now seated at the right hand of the Father, forever making intercession for us, saying, get up! But a lot of times, we just lay there. Although we're free, many times we perceive as if we are still in bondage. In fact, I think it's easier to blame life on bondage than to operate in the freedom given to us by Jesus Christ. Jesus is screaming out to us and in our spirits, get up! Even this morning, come on, come on, as worship's happening and that bass is kicking, there's something inside you, that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, that lives and dwells and abides on the inside of you, that has the life of God and the liberty of God. It's telling you even during worship and as that music is building, praise the Lord! He's saying, get up! Your spirit's saying, get up! Worship like I'm worthy! Worship like I'm honored! Worship like I died for you! But, but then there's the bondage side. There's the perception of bondage. I'm not going to raise my hand whenever someone's looking at me. As if you're so popular that everybody in here is going to stop and look, oh, did you see Johnny Smith raise his hand today in church? Must be the anointing. Must be having revival. Nobody's looking at you. That same spirit, he's calling out to get up. You're untied. But many of us lay by the side of the road of life in our hurts, in our habits, in our hang-ups, in our pain, not realizing that we have been set free. We have been set free. And even if someone comes along and tells us, come on, we're free! Maybe you are, but you don't know what I've been through. You don't know how hard life has been to me. You're free! That's okay for you, and that might be the truth for you, but for me, for what? For you what? Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. If you have Jesus Christ, you are free. Freedom becomes a way of life only as we replace our wrong thinking and our wrong believing with what the Word of God declares about our new condition. There's a new condition in your life. It's free, the free of the Lord. Do you know what my biggest problem is with church? Honestly, I believe it's my calling. I believe it's my fight. My own personal fight is the church itself. I hate legalism. I hate legalism. I hate, not people, but I hate when people are bound, still bound, in the chains of legalism, yelling at those who are free, you can't do that! You can't do that! Stop doing that! Even during worship, I gotta tell you, even during worship, I felt the spirit of judgment during worship. As we're doing that opening song, and it's like, poof, 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 and the lights are flashing, poof, 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 poof. and I felt like this, this judgmental spirit, like, like, oh, look at this church, like, they're, they're trying to look like a nightclub. <laughs> Why is it church felt they got to look like a nightclub? No, no, I'm just wondering where you think a nightclub got the idea from. 
You ever looked at Alaska at the Northern Lights? You ever heard of a God that said, let there be light, and there was light? You ever heard of a God that on the day of Pentecost, there was a sound as of a mighty rushing wind, and he put a light on the head of everyone that was in the room? Oh, but we're acting like the world by worshiping God with technology. Legalism. Staunch legalism, and it's the worst because it has a perception of holiness. It's the worst. It's the worst. It's bound people judging freedom. And they themselves can't even worship. People will go to churches and houses and temples and they can't even allow themselves to worship because they're standing in judgment of what's happening around them. So who's the problem? The free or the bound? Come on, somebody. Come on, come on. This is what we're talking about here today. We're talking about the freedom in Jesus. See, but, 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 but we can't get to this place where we can even talk about armor because we don't even know who we're supposed to be fighting. We got Christians putting up arms and armor against other Christians. Woo! Hey! Wrong believing in Jesus will never lead to right living. So let's talk about this. What does a spiritual attack look like? What does spiritual warfare actually look like? Because we think, you know, if you've been in church a long time, especially a faith-based church, everything's a spiritual attack. Everything's a spiritual attack. You're on a diet, you go to work, and someone brings brownies. Ah, the devil! (laughs) The tempter of the brethren. Dear Jesus. Right? Everything's a spiritual attack if you were, like, raised in church. But what does it actually look like? I want to be very clear. I want to be very precise with what I'm about to say. Okay, hear me clearly. Here's a spiritual attack. When the enemy, when the devil, when Satan, when spiritual forces locates an area of your life that has never been fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit, he will try to seize that unsurrendered area in your mind and your emotions, and energize it with all brand new vitality in life. When there's an area of your life that you haven't fully surrendered to God, let me me put it this this way. The sin that you deal with in your life is normally something you're already familiar with. You see, the devil, he's not omniscient, he's not omnipotent, he's not all-knowing. He doesn't know the future except for what the Word of God declares. He only knows your past. He only knows a thing that you've already struggled with. He already knows an appetite that you've already had. And and, and isn't it really the case that once you've opened that door and there's an area of your life that, that, that maybe there's been evil influence, that becomes that thing that you deal with over and over and over again? Come on, this is what's happening. This is what I'm trying to declare. This is where the battlefield is. The enemy will begin to use that stronghold to work against your growth and your development in freedom in Christ. See, what happens is when you have that area that's unsurrendered, the enemy wants to come in and he wants to build a stronghold. He wants to build a fortress. And he's going to start by laying a foundation, a pretty heavy, strong foundation. And he's going to mess with you in that area over and over and over and over and over again. He ain't got no new tricks. He's got no new tricks. It's the same old thing over and over again, maybe in a different generation. But it's the same kind of stuff. This is why our refusal to deal with certain areas of our lives bring about the greatest spiritual warfare. I'm going to deal with this, but... uh, I'm just going to hold on to it a little bit. I'm going to leave the door open a little bit. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. Satan knows precisely where to look to find the weak areas of your life. An area of your life that the enemy is going to try to kind of throw these darts at, number one, wrong thinking. Wrong thinking. So first let's say wrong thinking about you. Statements like, I can't. I wish I could. It's so hard. Vic- victim mentality. He, he's, he's just going to keep you a victim. He's going to keep you a victim. He's just going to keep, di- I, I have no choices. I have no options. Life is so hard. Wrong thinking. Wrong thinking towards God. If I do, God's going to be so disappointed at me. 
listen. I got to stop going on social media because I've been getting in these social media debates. <laughs> People telling me all this stuff about God. Can I just tell you something about God? God's not petty. He's not petty. He's not petty emotional like you and I. So when we try to say what God is saying, a lot of people say what God said in the Old Testament. A lot of that stuff that God was ticked off about in the Old Testament, he dealt with on the cross. He ain't petty, man. He ain't petty. God's not mad at you. How petty would it be for God to get mad at you about something he already knows you're going to do? And said you're forgiven for it. I know, I know, you ain't heard it preach like this before, right? We're still talking about the armor of God. We're still talking about spiritual warfare. But a lot of it's right here. Joyce Meyer's book, The Battlefield of the Mind. Great, great book if you've never read it. Talks about the battlefield of the mind. It's one of those areas in our lives where the most spiritual warfare happens. Can we just talk about it for a second? Okay, I'm going to. <laughs> you read your Bible, you pray. God wants to talk to you, yes? God wants to talk to you, yes? Yes, God wants to talk to you. Okay, how's he going to talk to you? He's going to talk to your spirit, right? How many of you know what your spirit actually sounds like? Few of us. Few of us, right? So how are we going to discern, how are we going to understand what our spirit received? It's got to go through our brain. It's got to go through our mind, right? It has to. That's the only way we can understand in the natural, what God has said. The Bible says his ways are higher than our ways, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and we get that. Spirit to spirit, he's going to speak to us, but our mind has to translate that into something that's understandable. Now, if you've been taught your whole life that God is angry at you, then when God says to you, why did you do that? What do you hear? You don't hear a God that's like, I love you so much. Why did you do that? I can show you a better way. What you heard is, why did you do that, idiot? <laughs> so stupid. Such a fool. Right? Because that's what, you're, that's what the filter, the clogged, dirty filter of your mind, your upbringing, how you talk to yourself, and you're saying that that's what God is saying. God ain't saying that. God's not saying that. When the Bible talks about him bringing reproof or correction, it's in the, the tense of a reproof and correction of God to the people of God is like a gentle correction. It's like when you train a baby. But our wrong thinking towards who God is makes him angry because we're angry. Wrong believing never leads to right living. Another area that the enemy can use, you ready? A traumatic event or a terrible memory that happened to you when you were a child. In that area of your life, he can have access to that and begin to taint and paint all sorts of pictures in your life as to why you are the way you are. Here's another one, ready? Fears that were transferred to you by your parents. Woo! Hey, can I talk to some adults for a moment? What your mom and dad said to you when you were a kid and the fears that they gave to you, they no longer apply. You're an adult now. Right? Some of y'all, can I say straight out, some of y'all, your parents messed you up. <laughs> your parents messed you up. Your parents taught you some stuff that is wrong. Is wrong. Right? Get down off of there, you're going to fall and break your neck. Now everyone's going to fall and break their neck. It's six inches off the ground, but everyone's going to fall and break their neck, right? Right? Come on, I'm just throwing some stuff out there. And, and we got these fears, these things that our parents said are fears. And then we live with them, and they're wrong. They're wrong. Years of incorrect doctrine taught to you by churches who were angry people themselves. And it had no revelation of a New Testament Jesus. I want you to notice this. The mind is the strategic center where spiritual warfare with the God of this world takes place. The mind, in your mind, in your mind is the strategic center. Why? 
Because we know this, whoever controls the mind controls your behavior. Ooh. Whoever controls the mind controls your behavior. This is why brainwashing is so powerful. This is why you need to be careful what kind of medication you allow doctors to put you on. There's some medication that's needed. There's some medication that's needed. But there's some medication that if it takes control of your mind, you're no longer, you're not even allowing God to be control of who you are. You be careful. And, and, and when I'm talking medication, I'm talking about recreational drugs that you're choosing to do too. Well, we got to talk about it in New York now. When that thing takes control of your mind, it can take control of your behavior. This is why it's important to train up a child in the way they should go so when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Because really, as we're teaching our kids and raising children, we're brainwashing them. We are. We're brainwashing them. We're telling them, don't touch a hot stove. Don't do that. We're teaching them two plus two is four. Right? We're teaching them that. We're putting that programming into their mind. What kind of programming are you putting into your mind about who you are as a spirit being? If we're really leaning to only an hour a week of scripture and word being put into our minds, and the rest of the week, it's the world, we're not going to live in victory. We're not going to live in freedom. Whoever controls the mind controls your behavior. That's why that's where the battlefield is. And if you're a believer in Jesus, listen to me, if you're a believer in Jesus, the war over your spirit is over. God's already got you. He's won. If you're a believer in Jesus, you've been sealed with a promise by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. Sealed. It's done. The war's over. So, what's the next best thing? Make your life on earth a living hell. That's the second best thing, because you can't have your spirit. So, make you emotionally unstable. Make you mentally unstable. Make you angry. Make, make you believe that you have to be addicted to all these things in life. Come on. There's no doubt about it. The mind is the strategic center of spiritual warfare. So I want to give you some, some scriptures here because I want you to understand this. By nature, by nature, our mind is rebellious to God. By nature, human nature. Because of one man's sin, Adam, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By nature, we are in rebellion to God. Romans 8, 7 says the carnal mind, the natural mind, is enmity against God. It's at war against God. It's at disagreement. Colossians 1, says that prior to your salvation experience, you were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18 says that unbelievers walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because the blindness of their heart. You see, your mind, apart from Jesus, is going to fight God. It's going to fight the goodness of God. And I would dare say and even say for a lot of Christians who don't have a fully renewed mind to the word of God, the judgmental spirit's the same thing. They don't understand the goodness of God. So we are initially born in this world with a nature that was self-alienated. It pushed away from God. The mind was in contrary to the word of God. And you find yourself in all sorts of self-destructive lusts of the flesh. A lot of us, even now, deal with self-destructive behavior. Can I point some out? Self-destructive behavior, ready? We, we, we get some sort of victory, some sort of freedom, some sort of win, and then we self-destruct. Examples, ready? You lose 10 pounds. Yo, guys, I lost 10 pounds. I'm going to treat myself to a slice of cake. <laughs> you idiot! Self-destructive. Why did you do that? Celebrate with a piece of celery. <laughs> Not me. Come on. Right? Yo, we just got out of debt. Yeah. Let's go get a new car. <laughs> I 
Pay off the credit card. Let's celebrate. Let's go on family vacation. How am I going to pay for it? Credit card. <laughs> Self-destructive. See, see, because people on the outside of self-destruction only think self-destruction is like self-harming, which is not good either. Inflicting external pain to conquer internal pain is never going to solve anything. And if we're in a church today where we don't understand that we are surrounded by people who need unconditional love, hmm. man, I, can I just pause for a second? I'm feeling somebody needing to hear this. You've, you found yourself in self-harming situations lately. And I would like to tell you today that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he was wounded for your transgressions. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of your peace was upon him, and by his stripes, his cutting, you're healed. He was cut. He was cut so that you don't have to cut. And I'm telling you, there's no judgment in this pulpit, but there's freedom and healing. You don't have to do that. You don't have to go down that road. And, and there, there, there's some who, who, who you think you're, you're not really doing it for those reasons. You're, glorif you're a glorified cutter. You pierce and tattoo. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with piercings and tattoos. What I'm saying is the reasoning for doing them, inflicting pain to relieve pain. It's a battlefield. It's a stronghold. There's an area that the enemy is trying to come in there, and although you're free in Jesus, he's got you bound up in pain. Whoever needed that, come see me after service. Ephesians 2, 3, Paul says to us, among whom also we, had, we all had our conversations in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and our minds, and by nature we are children of wrath, you ever seen a kid who, when they don't get their way, they just bug out? Yeah. Get all angry. That's that right there. And, and we all do it too. We all do it too. Someone cuts you off on the highway. You ask your spouse to do something, they don't do it. I thought I asked you to take out the trash. Now we miss the trash another day. Here's the big idea today. If we don't seek to renew our minds to the will of God and renew our emotions, we will live, ready, here's the big idea, we will live in the illusion of bondage. We will live in the illusion of bondage and, and, and that illusion of bondage will continue to dominate our lives. We will be the goat on the side of the road whom the son is set free, is free indeed, but I'm not, am I? Because if I was free, wouldn't I feel free? Can I ask you guys a question today? A anybody like keep their cell phone in their front pocket? Anybody keep their cell phone in or in your pocket? And then you keep it on silent mode or you have it on silent mode so you know it buzzes your leg? But then you ever have the phone not in your pocket, but you feel it buzz your leg? And you go to pick up your phone because you felt a phantom buzz? Yo, it's, yo, it's a condition now. <laughs> Phantom text response. Oh, you feel that, you feel that buzz. And, and then you go for your phone, it's not even in there. You've got it like on your cup holder or something in your car. You all know it's true. You know you do it. You know it happens. But it's that same thing. You felt your phone vibrate your leg, but it wasn't there. But it wasn't there. So was that real or not real? And we live in this illusion of bondage. I've got to act this way. I've got to do this. But you've been free. You've been free. Pastor Josh was doing some research and he came across a quote by a guy named Sun Tzu. And he stated that all warfare is based on deception. All warfare is based 
on deception. And the enemy knows that if your mind is renewed to the truth, then he cannot, he can't wage a successful war against you. So he's got to stop that. He's got to stop you from renewing your mind. That's why, you know what the hardest thing for a Christian to do is? Actually read their Bible. We have more access to the Bible than ever before. You got it on your cell phone, and it can remind you to read it, and you swipe it away. You could get on reading streaks, and it can even celebrate you. But, but we're reading it less. We have more access to church, but we're attending less. I'm just throwing some things out there, right? Because he knows. He knows that if he can stop us before the mind gets renewed, there's no fight. Like, he's defeated. But if we give up, there's no fight. This is why the scripture tells us this in Romans 12 too. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If the mind is renewed, it will transform who you are. If the mind is renewed, it will transform who you are. Even when it comes to dieting or being in health, you've got to change your thinking about food if you're going to actually win at a diet. Let me give you a quick tip. Food is fuel, not entertainment. Your car doesn't tell you what kind of gas to put in it. It just says, feed me gas. Now, you know, if you put cheap gas, it might ping or whatever, but it's fuel. It's fuel. It doesn't say, ah, I only have a half a tank. Can you give me more? It doesn't, it doesn't know that. It's fuel. But, but, but the mind has to be renewed. I'm sorry to say that on Super Bowl Sunday where we're all going to overeat. I'm just saying. <laughs> Ephesians 4.23 says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Ephesians 4.24 says, put on the new man. Colossians 3.10, put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him, who's, uh, that, him that created you. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. What's the key word here in that one? Let him. Let him. Let him hang out with you. Let him in your conversations. Let him dwell richly. Stop kicking him out. Stop booting him out. Let him dwell richly. 1 Peter 1.13, wherefore gird up your, the loins of your mind. So how do we do this, guys? How do, we, how do we live this life? How do we live the freedom and not the bondage? It starts with renewing the mind. We've got to renew the mind. We've got to change our thinking. How do I change my thinking? Meditate on the Word of God until it gets into your heart. Meditate on the Word of God until it gets into your heart. Head knowledge is not the same as heart knowledge. Head knowledge says, I agree that there is a God and He's in heaven. The heart says, I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. There's a difference. There's a difference. One is head knowledge. One is heart knowledge. We've got to get the word into our lives. Learning to live holy. Now, that's, that's, that, that, we could do a whole sermon on holiness. Because what ends up happening with holiness, what happened with the holiness movement, the holiness movement ended right around the same time that um, Woodstock came out. Right around that exact same time. Actually, I would say Woodstock was the death of the holiness movement. But holiness movement went so far that it became self-righteousness. I do all these things, and look how good I am, and you have to too. That's not what holiness is. Holiness says, I choose to live a life that honors and pleases God, and when I mess up, I bring it to the Father. Quick to admit when we mess up. Get back up and move it forward. That's holiness. Seeking to be conformed to the image of God every single day and learning how to walk after the Spirit. The Bible says, if you walk after the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Understand this. If you allow yourself to believe that you're still in bondage, 
that you're still in bondage to the old ways of life and the old conditions and the old pressures and powers, then you are lying on the roadside of life in the illusion of bondage. When Jesus Christ, the King of glory, who's seated at the right hand of the Father, forever making intercession for you, is screaming out to you, get up! Get up! All authority has been given unto you. Go! Get up! Make disciples of all men. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And do all these things that I have spoken to you. Go! Get up! I would. But one time, back in 1978, I did that one thing. And you know, God, I'm not sure that you forgave me for it. And get up! I would, God, but there's all these things that I'm struggling with. Get up! Hmm. I was about 10 years old. I was on a traveling soccer team for the town of Walkill. I was horrible at soccer. I don't know how I got on a team. I was on a soccer team. I was a little chubby kid. I was on defense. And the ball came to me. There was no one in front of me. I had to break away to the net. So my coach is like, go! Go for it. So my little chubby self running down the field, kicking his soccer ball, and I'm running as fast as I can, which wasn't really fast at all, but I'm running as fast as I can. Bow, running, bow, bow. I'm about 10 feet away from the net. Everyone's saying, shoot the ball, shoot the ball, and I want to I wanna shoot it, and I'm trying to get close. The goalie's coming out. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, boom, I get slide tackle, slid tackle, whatever, slide tackle out of nowhere. I hit the ground so hard, my teeth are still chattering to this day. Rock me. This person took me out so hard. I hit the ground, I break my collarbone, right? All I hear in the bleachers is my mom screaming, get up! Get up! Now, my mom has no mercy gift. Understand that. Get up! Get the ball! Score the goal! You're right there! I got up, but I was part broken. <laughs> my shoulder was hanging like this. I didn't understand what was happening. I didn't realize I had broke myself. The worst part about all this is the person who slid tackle me was a girl. A girl. It was co-ed soccer. She rocked my junk, broke my collarbone. But to this day, I'm 43 years old, to this day, when I find myself in a painful moment, when I find myself in a broken moment, when I find myself emotionally in pain or mentally in pain or stress trying to take over a situation in my life, I can hear my mom from the grandstands, from the bleachers, screaming out to me, get up, get up. Because I didn't have any fans but my mom. The Bible says that if God is for you, who can be against you? What shall man do unto you? You got to understand that the king of heaven, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, Elohim God, Yahweh, Jehovah God, the creator of all things, is your fan. He's your fan. He's cheering out to you. The echoes that bellow through eternity, get up! I am for you! You are a winner! You're an overcomer! You're free! We got to get up. We got to get up. And in a generation that's been shut down for so long, we got to get up. We got to get up. If you're here today, if you're here today, and there's something happening in your life right now that, it, that, that there's that stronghold, there's that bondage that's trying to, to creep its head up again, an area of your life that you haven't surrendered to God, and you know you need to surrender it today. It's, it's that thing like, you know it's wrong, but you want it to be right for you. So you say, God, you know, I, I love you so much. Just this one area I'm just going to kind of ignore. 
Maybe it's time today to surrender. And I'm going to tell you what full surrender is, okay? In all transparency and humility, an addict knows an addict. Full surrender is not lip service. Full surrender is action. Full surrender is going to your house and getting all the things that are hard for you out of the house. Your alcohol, your stash, whatever, whatever, whatever the stronghold is, whatever the problem is. And, 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 and please, like, if you're here today and you're like, yo, what's this guy doing? Like, he's about to ruin my life. All humility, all humility. I want you healthy. I want you healthy, right? So for the person that one drink is one too many, you know what I'm talking about. You gotta get it out of the house. And then I know you more than you know yourself. I'm not just saying the main cabinet. I'm talking about the one in the rafter in the basement and the one out in the shed and the one you keep in the trunk of the car. Because the one thing I know about you and I know about me is that there's multiple stashes because you got the backup plan to the backup plan. Full surrender as you have it all, God. I'm not judging. No, no judgment here at all. I'm saying, I'm saying freedom. I'm saying surrender. The only way that we win at this game of life is surrender to him, to the king of glory, to the call in our lives. Father, I thank you for those today who have come in here and there's something, there's a stronghold in their life. Whether that stronghold is a poor self-image, self-hatred, codependency, addiction, drug abuse, internet pornography, whatever it is, God, the thing that keeps trying to cycle back in the Christian life, Lord, I pray that we have the victory over that, that we are not slaves to those things. We're not in bondage to those things. Whom the Son has set free is free. Indeed, help our minds to be renewed, that in moments of stress, in moments of pressure, that we would not return to the familiar. We would not return to the former but we would turn to you. God, help us. Help us put people in our lives and put people in our place that we can call upon in a moment of need. I pray, God, that before we ever think about picking up armor or weapons, we deal with the areas in our minds that we've allowed access to. Help us to bring freedom today. Lord, I pray that no spouse would use anything that was said today as a weapon against their spouse making them do what we said, Lord, because we understand that until it's a personal decision to be free, no one can make that happen for us. Lord, I pray today that your word will never return void. It will accomplish exactly what it was set forth to do today. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would work in our hearts and our minds throughout this week. As we leave here today, I pray that we are protected and safe. Just as we are protected coming in, we'll protect it going out. Bless the works of our hands and everything we set them to. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you were the person I was talking to, come see me. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor Josh, and if this message has impacted you in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a few things. First, I would love if you would subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 and 11.30 a.m. Second thing is, I'm going to ask that you would take a next step on your journey, and we'd love to help you do that. You can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today. Have a great rest of your day.